So my job is to get this going. I'm not going to introduce the speakers because you have their bios and I think they're distinguished enough to need no introduction. I'll just describe briefly what this panel is about. Uh, the field of foreign relations law, when I started law school uh, many decades ago, uh, consisted of one book by Lewis Henkin and I don't think any law review articles to speak of. Uh, in the last 15 years, this field has really blown up uh, it has become something that anyone who does federal courts or international law or constitutional law is engaged in. The field of foreign relations law is a space where th these three old subjects now commingle. Uh, uh, Brad and AJ's article is uh, one of the most important contributions to this field, I think. We're going to let them go first and uh, stake out their position. Uh, Carlos Vasquez is going to have the first response, followed by Jean Galbraith, who has engaged this subject, I think, most recently, uh, at least in the pages of the Virginia Law Review. And then Judge Kavanaugh is going to, as I like to say, that cleanup. And uh, then we'll give uh, Brad and AJ a chance to defend themselves. Gentlemen. Great. Um, well, we're, we're going to split up this time. Um, at the beginning, and then we're going to save a little time for rebuttal at the end. Um, I just wanted to thank the Law Review for hosting this event. Um, I'm a big fan of student-run law reviews. I think uh, most of us uh, were student editors of our, our own law reviews when we were in law school, and uh, I think everything uh, that was said at the beginning is true about the importance and um, experience of being on the Law Review. So I congratulate you for uh, 100 years of excellent Law Review. Uh, articles and notes uh, through the years. Um, so the article that we're going to discuss today is called The Law of Nations as Constitutional Law, and we wrote this article uh, as part of a larger project. We're actually working on a book on this topic that will be out probably next year. Um, but there's been an ongoing debate, as uh, Professor Stephen mentioned, uh, in the last 15 or 20 years about the proper role of customary international law in U.S. courts. and. Uh, there had been essentially two primary approaches that uh, legal academics had put forth on this topic. And the, uh, I'll just give you those positions quickly and then tell you uh, why we wrote our article and how our position differs from those uh, previous positions. So the, the modern position, as it's been called, suggests that customary international law should come into to court as a form of federal common law. In essence, uh, courts have an Article III power, if you will, in, federal, in, in cases of federal courts, to incorporate uh, customary international law, the modern law of nations, into federal law. And that federal common law is uh, preemptive of contrary state law, and it is capable of supporting federal question jurisdiction on this view. Um, now, that has raised uh, questions of constitutional legitimacy, uh, particularly because under that position, judges uh, do this on their own, in effect. They look around, find the relevant principles, if they're well established enough, and then they bring them into federal law. And so the revisionist position uh, rose up in response and said, uh, this is inconsistent with some aspects of the constitutional structure, uh, federalism, separation of powers, the Erie Doctrine. Um, in our view, some actor in the U.S. system has to adopt the customary international law and incorporate it as part of U.S. law before courts should really give it that kind of effect. So if it's going to be federal law, it should be adopted uh, as a statute by the Congress and the President or as a treaty by the President and the Senate. Um, or it could even be adopted as state law uh, through the state legislature or state common law. Um, they might incorporate part of it as state law. But unless it's incorporated as some kind of domestic U.S. law, it doesn't really, courts don't really have the authority to uh, apply it in their courts. So um, those two positions presented something of an all or nothing uh, alternatives, right? Um, it all comes in, sort of, or it all stays out, depending on whether it's been adopted. And while there are things to be said in favor and against both positions, we felt that neither position really accurately captured the 
relationship between customary international law and particularly traditional principles of the law of nations that existed at the time of the founding of the Constitution when it was written, um, and the U.S. legal system. So what we tried to do was come up with an approach that was somewhere in between, um, and that was tied more closely to the actual text of the Constitution. So sometimes we call this the allocation of powers approach or uh, con you know, constitutional approach, whatever you want to call it. Um, but basically what we say, say is that you should look to, courts should look to specific provisions of the Constitution, specifically provisions of Articles 1 and 2 of the Constitution where powers are granted, foreign relations and war powers are granted to Congress and the President. And in particular, we focused in this article on four such powers. The war power granted to Congress, um, the power to recognize foreign countries, which is uh, derived from the power to send and receive ambassadors and the power to make treaties, um, the power to grant letters of mark and reprisal, and the power to, to regulate or govern captures on land and water, which are assigned to Congress. And these powers, all of these powers, incorporate terms in the Constitution drawn from the law of nations at the time of the founding. So there are a lot of terms in the Constitution that are terms of art that aren't defined. And these terms in particular fall in that category. But they're all drawn from a pre-existing body of law, the law of nations. So the terms like war, ambassador, letter of mark and reprisal, capture, they had defined meanings and understandings. And so our, our thesis really is that courts should examine carefully the allocation of these powers in light of the meaning of those terms at the time they were adopted. And that will help courts understand who has the responsibility for both upholding international law and departing, I think more importantly, departing from international law, because that's often a, an important question. Um, so for example, uh, just to give a really easy example, I guess, um, there's, there's one um, uh, question that, is, that has not been resolved. It's still a question today, and it hasn't been codified by Congress or the President and the Senate in a treaty. Um, which is the question of head of state immunity. When a foreign head of state uh, comes to the United States, do they have immunity from being sued or, or served with process, et cetera? Um, historically, they have such immunity under the law of nations, but it hasn't been codified. So modern position people would say, well, that's federal common law. They have immunity. The revisionist position people would say, uh, no, sorry, unless state law, which might incorporate this immunity, grants it to them, they don't have it. Uh, but we think it's a little bit more, uh, can it be answered more directly by reference to provisions of the constitutional text, which is to say, when the United States, through the President and or the Congress, recognizes a foreign state or a foreign government and recognizes the head of government and, or the head of state, um, that act under a constitutional power had Implications, well-known implications, right? So when you recognized an ambassador and you recognized the state, um, the head of state obtained this immunity. If you didn't recognize the government or the, the state, uh, they didn't. And um, we can tie that more directly to a specific provision. So I guess um, I'm going to leave it at that and uh, allow AJ to give a few more uh, examples, and then we'll reserve some time to see what the other people have to say. All right. Well, let me first add another word of thanks to the Law Review for putting this event together. I know how much work it is, especially to pull it off as effectively and professionally as, as you all have, so thank you. And you know, thanks also to the other members of our panel for um, the opportunity to talk about our, our work. It, it's, it's a privilege to celebrate this anniversary with you, um, and it, Brad and I talked about back when we placed this article in the Virginia Law Review. It's, a, it's an honor to publish in a journal that has a tradition of straddling both the worlds of general understandings about law, but then also contributing in very meaningful ways to, um, 
its practice and development, which is just a long way of saying that I think we're both very happy to be here. So let me just add a few words to um, Professor Clark's. In, in this article, one, one thing that we tried to do was to deal with the precedent, the, the, mostly the Supreme Court precedent that surrounds this issue. There's, there's something of a canon of cases that have developed in this area um, that everybody argues about and tries to figure out what they mean. Um, the Neri, the Paqueta Habana, Sabatino. And in part, um, these cases have received special focus because they contain this statement that um, international law is part of our law. And one of the questions is, what, what, what does that mean? Right? It's, it's hard to say. The phrase is so general. And the cases have been decided over time in such different contexts. And in writing this article, you know, we, we thought that these cases deserved very close examination in the context in which they, they were decided. And so, as Professor Clark alluded to, you know, our claim about these cases is that the, the better understanding of them, not, not the only understanding of them, but the better understanding of them is that over time, Courts have respected rights of foreign sovereigns under the law of nations in order to avoid usurping the powers that Articles 1 and 2 give the political branches exclusively over certain foreign relations matters. I'm not going to rehash the article, but consider, consider two bookends in this canon. You know, one would be on, on the early side. Uh, just to bring this idea to life, the 1815 prize case of the Neride. So this case involved a U.S. privateer who captured goods belonging to a Spanish neutral, but the goods were found on a British enemy vessel. And the question the court had to decide was whether the court should uphold his capture of the neutral property even though it violated Spain's rights to neutrality under the law of nations? That was the question. The privateer urged the court to uphold his capture of the property on, on this ground. Quote, Spain would subject American property under similar circumstances to capture. And the court, in an opinion written by Justice Marshall, Chief Justice Marshall, rejected this claim because he said that to ignore Spain's neutral rights under the law of nations would amount to a usurpation of the political branch's exclusive powers to retaliate against Spain. In other words, it would usurp the political branch's exclusive power to issue letter of, letters of mark and reprisal and authorize captures in retaliation for the acts of a foreign government. And if you think about it, this line of reasoning makes some sense. The power of the political branches over reprisals and captures made sense only in light of a background set of assumptions that the law of nations supplied about how, as a general matter, nations and their citizens would respect neutral rights and the other sovereign rights of, of nations. If a court violated those rights, absent authorization by the political branches, courts would be assuming for themselves the prerogative of the political branches to retaliate against other nations. And this, the Marshall Court said, the courts may not do. I think that case provides an example of how the court tied its application of the law of nations as a rule of decision to a very specific power of the political branches. There's no denying that over time, this kind of reasoning became much more diffuse and less tied to specific textual provisions of the Constitution, but it did not and has not evaporated altogether. So fast forward to the other bookend in this canon, um, Sabatino, decided in 1964. This is a diversity suit that arises out of the new Cuban government's nationalization of sugar companies located in Cuba, but owned at least in part by US citizens. So the question 
is whether Cuba or the original American owner is entitled to the proceeds of the sugar that are sold by the company after Cuba appropriated it. The original U.S. owner claimed that it should get the proceeds because Cuba's expro expropriation violated a norm of customary international law. Cuba violated international law by taking the refineries. And so we, the original owners, should get the proceeds. But the Supreme Court refused to apply that norm of international law, that asserted norm anyway. Instead, the court sided with Cuba and applied the act of state doctrine, which forbids courts from questioning the act of a foreign sovereign taken within its own territory. This doctrine finds its roots in the traditional rights of nations to territorial sovereignty under the law of nations. Why did the court apply the act of state doctrine and not the rule of international law that would have held Cuba to have acted unlawfully? Well, for reasons that were related to the reasons the court gave in the near eyed, even though they were not as specific. The court said the act of state doctrine respecting ter Cuba's territorial sovereignty has constitutional underpinnings. The doctrine implements a basic choice regarding the competence and function of the judiciary and the political branches in ordering our relations with other nations. Could the court have tied its decision to a more specific provision of the Constitution? It, it could have, I think. Cuba was recognized by the United States. And as a recognized nation, Cuba traditionally held certain rights under the law of nations. But then also under the somewhat forgotten rep reprisal and capture powers. For the court to say, Cuba, you acted wrongfully within your own territory, and we hereby order you to relinquish any claim you have to the proceeds of this sale, would have been a judicial reprisal. And had this case arisen during the Marshall Court, I think that reasoning may well have carried the day. Um, the court's opinion in Sabatino says that United States courts apply international law as part of our own in appropriate circumstances. What are those circumstances? Well, as we argue in this, in this piece, one of those circumstances is when for the court not to apply the law of nations or a traditional principle derived therefrom would be effectively to undermine an exclusive authority of the political branches over foreign relations. Um, hence the title, the law of nations is constitutional law. There are certain instances in which the Constitution simply requires it. And, you know, just to say a quick word and then I'll stop about the legacy of, of this article. It's relatively recent. It's hard to define a legacy, but if you can define one, I think that we set out to accomplish. This has been a very important debate and it's not going away. And when we wrote this article, you know, I, I think we aspired in the best traditions of the Virginia Law Review to analyze an important issue um, in a way that faithfully accounts for text, history, structure, and in a way that relies on reasons that are germane to the work that, that judges do. Um, that was something that was quite important to us as we approached the article. So anyway, I'll, um, I'll stop there, but that's the piece and that's what we set out to do. So the last few uh, pages of their article are responding, sort of pre-responding to what they understood to be a disagreement they had with Professor Carlos Vasquez. And uh, Professor Vasquez is here to defend himself. Thank you. Um, I want to begin also by thanking the Virginia Law Review for uh, putting this uh, conference on and putting this panel on and inviting me to speak on this panel. Um, I'm a great admirer of uh, the work of, uh, of Professors Belia and Clark on, in this area. Uh, this article, a previous article in the Columbia Law Review, uh, related articles um, on um, 
other aspects of uh, customer international law, uh, and um, and I'm very much looking forward to the upcoming book, which I understand they're working on. Uh, so um, uh, I'm uh, very glad to be on the panel. Um, one of the uh, I'm a great, as I said, I'm a great admirer of the uh, of this article, um, and. Uh, at the same time, I am a defender of the modern position on the status of customer international law as a preemptive federal law, as, as binding on the states. Um, in my view, I think the, the uh, article does a masterful job of supporting the modern view. And uh, I think it, it articulates what I have always regarded as the strongest argument for the modern position, that uh, customer international law is uh, binding on the states and preemptive of uh, state law in the sense that uh, states are not permitted to violate customer international law um, <clears throat> in the absence of affirmative authorization by the political branches. Uh, so um, uh, I, I think uh, the, the argument of professors Billy and Clark uh, and mine are, are very much dovetail, and um, as you can probably tell from the fact that they uh, disagree with me, the, the discussion of the disagreement with my position comes at page 104 of a 110-page 100, of article. Um, but there are a, a couple of areas in, of, of uh, 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 disagreement, uh, and I will uh, focus on those. Um, first, um, well, let me, let me say the, uh, the modern position, uh, adherence of the modern position uh, aren't uniform, and, and there are some differences among adherents of the modern position, and the, uh, the uh, version of the modern position that I think uh, the article by uh, Professors Billy and Clark uh, supports is, unsurprisingly, uh, my version of it, uh, which is, uh, focuses on the bindingness of customer international law on the states. So there are uh, other claims sometimes made by uh, adherents of the modern position that go beyond that. Um, uh, uh, for example, the extent to which uh, customer international law is binding on uh, executive officials. Uh, I, uh, as I've written, the, the adherents of the modern positions take varying views on that, and so I don't view that as a central aspect of the modern position, the extent to which it's binding on the president or on the executive branch, uh, if, if binding on the executive branch uh, uh, on which uh, uh, officials, the president, uh, cabinet level officials, lower level officials. Uh, there are varying positions that have been taken uh, by adherents of the modern position on that question. So my focus has been on uh, the um, uh, applicability of uh, customer international law to the states and the extent to which um, states are precluded from violating customer international law unless uh, the political branches have affirmatively authorized it. So I've, I bracket the issue of which uh, combination of the political branches are required to violate uh, customer international law or to authorize a violation? Is, is it an act of Congress that's necessary, an act of the executive branch, uh, or an act of, an act of the president, or, or, or um, uh, perhaps even uh, acts of uh, cabinet-level officials might be sufficient to authorize a violation? Uh, those are issues I bracket and I, uh, I focus, as do Professors Billy and Clark, on uh, the states. Uh, so what are the, the areas, uh, the questions on which we differ? Um, I, uh, one, one area is on uh, whether we should, well, one area that uh, Professors Billy and Clark um, uh, uh, indicate uh, is an area of difference that they have with the modern position is the, the use of the term federal common law to describe the status of customer international law. This actually is not uh, uh, an area in which they differ from me, because I also have criticized the use of the term federal common law uh, to describe the status of customer international law. I think it's uh, misleading in the sense uh, uh, that saying that it's that um, applying customer international law is federal common lawmaking suggests that the federal courts make the law, which I don't think is true. Uh, Alternatively, it might be understood as saying that the federal courts determine that customer international law is uh, federal law. Um, and I, I agree with uh, uh, Professors Billy and Clark when they criticize that uh, understanding, that conceptualization 
of uh, the role of uh, customer international law. I agree with them that they, they, uh, the courts apply customer international law because it is federal law. They don't make it federal law by deciding to incorporate it. So I, I, I also uh, quarrel with the use of the term federal common law, although I don't think this is a major, uh, a major issue. I think it ultimately it's a semantic point. I think it does share many of the aspects of federal common law uh, in that it's uh, binding on states and it can be uh, 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 altered or repealed by the political branches through, the, uh, at a minimum, through the regular lawmaking uh, power. So I, um, I, it shares many of the characteristics of federal common law, but I, I don't think the use of the term federal common law uh, to describe it is helpful. Um, at best, it should be considered a shorthand for, for, to describe its status. So this is, um, I, I don't think, a, a significant difference between their position and mine, uh, although uh, it is a, a difference between their position and mine uh, versus uh, some of the uh, uh, other versions of the modern position that do uh, describe uh, customer international law as federal common law and describe and understand the courts to be making uh, federal common uh, making federal common law when they uh, apply customer international law. Um, another possible uh, point of difference is regarding the range of international law norms that uh, are binding on the states and courts. I think this is uh, um, a, a more significant area of possible disagreement between the two of us, or the three of us. Um, uh, first, um, well, uh, it's not entirely clear from the article uh, whether Professors Billy and Clark take the position that all norms, all, all aspects of the, of the state to state part of the law of nations uh, are binding on the states. Um, as I understand the article and the previous uh, article in Columbia Law Review, I, I think that's their position. So they, they do argue that not all of what was uh, considered the law of nations at the time of the founding uh, was binding on the states. Uh, but uh, as I understand their argument on this point, the, uh, the parts that are excluded are the parts that we do not today regard as customary international law. They're the parts that co correspond to uh, private international law or simply general commercial law. These are areas that were once thought to be part of uh, uh, the law of nations, but they're parts that we don't today regard as customary international law. They distinguish these parts of the law of nations from the state to state portion of the law of nations, and that is, that does correspond to what we today regard as customary international law. And, uh, they can correct me if, if I'm misreading their argument, but I, as I understand their argument, all of that part of uh, the law of nations was binding on the states. Um, but uh, so if that's the case, then again, that's, that's not a, a difference between uh, their position and mine, uh, uh, because my position is that only the part of the law of nations that we today regard as uh, customary international law is binding on the states. Uh, but uh, an, uh, another um, issue that I think is, uh, is uh, one that uh, we disagree on is regards a, a, a portion of customer international law that did not exist at the time of the founding that does exist today, and that is the law of human rights. And so this is the focus of the uh, discussion in the article uh, about the difference, uh, the, the respect in which their art argument differs from mine. Um, so uh, the position of professors uh, Billy and Clark is that um, at the time of the founding, international law did not recognize uh, 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 norms that limit a state's power to act vis-a-vis -vis its own nationals. It was all, it, it, involves, uh, it involved uh, relations between states and to the extent it involved uh, individuals, it involved the way one state could treat nationals of another state. So that was uh, uh, an aspect of uh, it, international law at the time of the founding that differs from uh, the way it's understood today. Today, we still, of course, have that uh, part of international law. We have norms of that nature, but we also have norms 
that uh, address how a, how a state treats its own nationals. So uh, the question arises, uh, should, um, should that part of customary international law today be deemed uh, to be preemptive uh, of state law? Should, be, should, we, should it be deemed to be binding on, on the states? And um, uh, Professor Julian Clark argued that, uh, no, that's a, a different, it, that part of international law is sufficiently different that it should not be uh, uh, regarded as binding on the states. Their theory does not support treating it as binding on the states. Um, I think this, this, this question raises a larger question about how constitutional law should respond to changes in the nature and, and content of international law, uh, which is a part of a larger uh, question about how constitutional law should respond to change in general. Um, this is, an, uh, I think, an issue that um, Professors Billy and Clark intend to discuss at great, in greater depth in future work, uh, and I think it's a very interesting one. Uh, but I, uh, I should say that I don't, uh, uh, the arguments that they give for uh, uh, concluding that their argument does not support treating uh, human rights law as binding and preemptive uh, do not convince me. Um, first of all, um, uh, one, one possible argument could be that uh, only the norms of international law as they existed in 1789 should be deemed binding. Uh, on, the, on the states and preemptive of state law. But Professors Billy and Clark clearly and rightly, I think, reject that, that position. Uh, they discuss that possible, that possible view uh, when they discuss Sabatino and the Act of State Doctrine, and they clearly uh, uh, reject it, and I think rightly so. Uh, cases, the cases, I think, clearly show that uh, uh, to the extent international law has been applied and has been applied as part of our law, it has not been a static international law as it existed in 1789. It's a, a, a more dynamic, uh, a, a, uh, the, the application of international law has been more dynamic, has uh, applied norms that have come into being since the founding. And uh, I think the Paquete Habana is a clear indication of that where the court uh, uh, recognized that a norm had come into being uh, fairly recently at the time. So I don't think, uh, I think they are right to reject the static view, the view that international law has been incorporated statically as it existed in 1789. Uh, however, when they discuss why human rights norms uh, should not be deemed uh, uh, to fall within this, uh, uh, the preemptive scope of customer international law, I think uh, they fall back on uh, something like the static view. So um, uh, they say that the, uh, the, the war power theory, for example, does not support treating uh, human rights norms as preemptive and binding on the states. Uh, but um, as, I, as I read their argument, it boils down to the argument that in 1789, uh, the violations of human rights were not deemed uh, a justification for going to war under international law. That's true, but that's more or less the same as saying that human rights norms did not exist. The new international law then did not address how a state could, uh, could treat its own nationals. And so I think um, the response to this, this, in this on this point uh, seems to fall back on a static view. Uh, the, uh, they similarly argue that the recognition argument, the idea that uh, the, the recognition power entails an obligation of states to comply with the, the uh, rights of foreign states under international law, doesn't support um, treating human rights norms as preemptive uh, because uh, this category of human rights of international law norms did not exist at the time which again, I think, boils down to the argument that uh, uh, it, it, it calls to mind the static argument that they, I think, correctly rejected in, in, in discussing Sabatino. Um, the, I think there are broader issues here that uh, need to be uh, examined and, and uh, thought about. Uh, um, again, the, um, there are deeper translation issues. Uh, 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 how, do you, how, how should current doctrine respond to changes in in, uh, in international law. For, ex for example, the war power theory uh, is based on the idea that um, 
when states uh, violate the international law rights of other states, uh, they um, uh, threaten the nation with war. Uh, and that is a, um, uh, when they do so, they impinge upon the executive or the, the political branch's exclusive power regarding war making. Um, but uh, as, as they note in their article, today, um, a violation of international law by one state does not justify going to war. Uh, international law has evolved to the point where uh, um, use of force is very rigidly um, uh, limited and uh, uh, one nation is not justified in using force against another nation merely because the other nation has violated a norm of international law. Does this mean that the war powers argument is now obsolete? Uh, that's one possible conclusion, but I don't think that's a conclusion that Professors Billy and Clark uh, would draw. Um, another uh, way to um, uh, adjust to this um, change in international law would be to um, uh, uh, address the issue at a higher level of generality, which, would I, which is what I have done. I mean, the the um, the. the uh, the concern that underlay the preemptive force of customary international law uh, as understood at the founding uh, is, might be understood as a, a concern about creating uh, uh, international, uh, provoking other states, not just to war, but to, uh, 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 to other sorts of unfriendly uh, 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 attitudes towards the United States, and when, when uh, when a state does that, arguably, the, uh, it impinges on not, perhaps not the war power, but the broader uh, foreign affairs power of the federal government. Now, you know, whether there is a, a broader unenumerated foreign affairs power is very much debated, but I think as a similar argument about impinging on uh, the, uh, the prerogatives of the political branches of the federal government could be articulated at somewhat broader level of generality to support um, uh, 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 an argument to the effect that um, that state conduct that uh, uh, produces uh, um, a certain degree of hostility on the part of other states uh, should be preempted. And this then, if, if one takes this route, um, uh, the argument that uh, the, the Belia Clark argument for treating customer international law as binding on the states begins to shade into the dormant foreign relations power, which uh, uh, has been recognized by the court, but is controversial uh, among scholars and among uh, current members of the court. So um, this is uh, an, uh, it's, it's an issue that, that uh, Professors Billy and Clark discuss and is also a, a potential area of disagreement between their argument and mine, since I've, I've defended the dormant foreign relations power as well. Um, anyway, um, so I think uh, you know, how one deals with, uh, how one deals with change in international law is a, is a very large question, a very broad question and a uh, difficult question that I think uh, um, and, uh, 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 I think is uh, uh, a, a very interesting question and one, the answer to which is, is, is not self-evident. I mean, um, uh, to the extent one is uh, uh, asking uh, uh, or considering changes uh, since the founding, one might also uh, ask, uh, whether anything should be made of the fact that uh, at the founding we were a small nation uh, that uh, was much more vulnerable to uh, reprisals from other states. Today we're a large nation and uh, reprisals from other states are less likely and, and uh, likely to be less serious uh, uh, to our overall well-being. So is that a, a change in the law that, or a change in circumstances that should lead to a difference in um, in the, um, uh, the weight we give to customer international law and the extent to which we regard it as binding on the states. Um, it's, a, it's a question to be asked and is part of the broader issue that I'm raising about um, uh, how constitutional law should respond to changes in the nature of international law and to broader changes more generally. 
Um, and I'm not suggesting an answer except to say that, I, that the, that sort of argument is one that I have not seen uh, made in uh, constitutional uh, discussions, uh, at least in the foreign relations area. Uh, well, I, I'm out of time. There's one more um, difference, potential difference, between their argument and mine, but it, in fact it's, it's not uh, a significant difference, and that is the applicability of uh, uh, customer international law with respect to foreign sovereigns. Um, uh, this is another area where I think uh, their, their position may differ from the position of some adherents of the modern position, but it doesn't... Uh, doesn't really differ from mine. Uh, mine doesn't differ from theirs in that, in, uh, on this point. Um, on this, uh, just to, to give a, a two-sentence summary, since I am out of time, uh, I'll quote my, my own professor, uh, Lewis Henkin, uh, uh, who is who's very much uh, associated with the modern position. And he took the position in, in writing about Sabatino that um, the notion that international law is part of our law is relevant only when we're talking about uh, the United States compliance with international law, which includes compliance by the states as well. When we're talking about Cuba's compliance with international law, the, the idea that international law is part of our law is not relevant, because Cuba is not subject to our law. Cuba is subject to international law, qua international law, but Cuba is not subject to international law as part of our law. So the idea that international law is part of our law is not really relevant to whether foreign states are bound by it. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there, but I'm uh, um, uh, uh, happy to uh, engage in further discussion after, well, I, I suppose I won't have a, uh, another uh, shot at it, uh, uh, but uh, I look forward to the, uh, the comments of my colleagues. On the Thank you, Carlos. Uh, Professor Galbraith. Thank you. So I also want to join in congratulating the Virginia Law Review on 100 years and to thank you all for inviting me to comment on this panel. And like Carlos, I think this is an incredibly admirable piece of scholarship, and particularly impressive when we consider that it is just one of a multi-year, many article series of projects excavating sort of issues around the early meaning of the Constitution and the law of nations and how they relate to each other. So what I want to do in these comments is basically two things. First, to offer some questions and mostly doubts that I had on reading this piece on its own terms, and then to try to situate it more broadly uh, within the debates that are going on today in the field and with regard to the methodology of approach to constitutional interpretation that we should be taking. So Blee and Clark see their project as identifying the original public meaning of the Constitution although they further suggest that other forms of constitutional interpretation support the position they develop. And they conclude that the written constitution, in its original public meaning, provides that US courts should apply some, but not all, principles of public, international, of public customary international law to, in the adjudicating cases. And specifically, they say that courts should apply customary international law where it relates to issues Regard, that the Constitution has entrusted to the political branches, such as the recognition power, such as the power to uh, make, deal with capture, such as the declare war power, and so forth. So what I want to do is first to offer a sense of doubt about whether what this project is doing is really looking at the original public meaning of the Constitution, and second to ask whether this conclusion that the Constitution only authorizes federal courts to apply certain but not all aspects of the law of nations as a default principle in adjudicating cases is really borne out by the early evidence. So first, is this really an account of original public meaning? Now this approach to originalism asks what meaning is conveyed by the text of the written constitution at the time of its adoption. And to me, Belia and Clark's approach requires inferences that go far beyond what the text of the Constitution itself suggests. So let's take the fact that the written Constitution provides that the Congress shall have power to declare war. Now, it's clear that the law of nations is relevant to understanding what the words declare war mean. But I have a lot of trouble concluding that the Congress shall have power to declare war also means that the courts of the United States shall, in the absence of congressional action, enforce the law of nations with regard to prize and immunity. 
And don't get me wrong, I think it's perfectly reasonable as a constitutional matter for the courts of the United States to enforce the law of nations with regard to prize and diplomatic immunity. But I don't think this stems from the text of the Constitution. Instead, this principle for me rests more generally in the context, needs, and norms of the times, as signaled by the intent of the framers, by structural principles, and by the early developing uh, precedents in the Supreme Court. The only way I can comfortably find this principle in the original public meaning of the Constitution is to redefine the concept of original public meaning so as to make it a holistic inquiry rather than a textual inquiry. So I find Belia and Clark's article most interesting and most persuasive, not as a count of the original public meaning of the written Constitution, but rather as an excavation of constitutional meaning and practice more generally. And the question I now wish to turn to is the extent to which this exploration of constitutional meaning that they conduct really leads to the conclusion that the courts of the United States are to enforce some but not all principles of the public law of nations. Now, they suggest that court, U.S. courts are applying only some aspects of the law of nations, namely those that relate to recognition, to prize and captures, and to causes for war. And here they differ from scholars who have read these early cases to stand for the broader principle that U.S. courts were applying the public law of nations generally. Now, if we just look at the outcome of these cases and try to figure out which of these theories is correct, then we run quickly into the problem of indistinguishable evidence. And this is because the 19th century law of nations cases that came up basically were cases that related in these areas. And so it's hard to tell just from looking at the outcomes whether what the courts were doing was applying particular aspects of the law of nations or just taking the approach that we're going to apply the law of nations writ large. So because of this, it's important to go further and consider the purpose for which U.S. courts applied customary international law. Was it out of domestic concerns or was it out of a broader respect for international law? If it was out of domestic concerns, then perhaps the courts were focused only on certain areas of customary international law. But if it's out of respect for international law more generally, then the courts were more likely open to accepting the full set of customary legal principles. Now, Blee and Clark make the argument that courts applied customary international law out of domestic concerns about the U.S. separation of powers. And in their view, the Supreme Court applied the law of nations in order to give the political branches space for decision making. If there was going to be cause for war, and failure to enforce certain principles of the law of nations could be a cause for war, then the Supreme Court wanted the political branches to be the ones to create this cause for war and to do so knowingly. Now, I think William Clark do a terrific job of showing that this separation of powers point was an important purpose behind why the Supreme Court applied customary international law. But I don't think this is sufficient to justify their ultimate conclusion that this related only to certain aspects of customary international law in the public sense. And I say this for two reasons. So the first is that the separation of powers approach could also support the conclusion that U.S. courts should apply customary international law generally, rather than just the specific aspects of it. To conclude that their separation of powers approach requires courts only to apply particular areas of the law of nations, Belia and Clark rely heavily on the textual ties to Article I and Article II, like the declare war power. Now, as I've said, I don't find these textual ties to be particularly persuasive. But even if they are persuasive, I would think that a similar logic would call for acceptance of a comparable tie to the treaty power. And because the treaty power allows nations to contract out of some, although not all, principles of customary international law, you could similarly say that courts of the United States should be applying customary international law in order to leave it to the political branches to make the decision to change that through the treaty power. Even more generally, though, I think as Carlos has suggested, the basic benefit that Belia and Clark see is flowing out of the U.S. courts applying customary international law is to ward off the friction that comes with violations of customary international law. And that principle can apply generally to law of nations, not just to the particular principles that they identify here. 
Now, the second reason that I think Bolia and Clark's showing of separation of powers rationale doesn't justify their conclusion that U.S. courts should apply only aspects of the law of nations is that they haven't shown that this was the only rationale. And there was another complementary purpose at work as well. And this was respect for customary international law under what I would call a rule of law norm. Blackstone describes how governments have not only the interest but also the duty to comply with the public law of nations. And just as we see the separation of powers concerns reflected in Supreme Court language surrounding their law of nations cases, so too we also see respect for the law of nations for its own sake. Lee and Clark show, I think, very elegantly how the 19th century Supreme Court decisions can be read through a separation of powers lens. But I think I could just as easily take these cases and read them through a respect for the rule of law, respect for customary national law as a rule of law lens. And if US courts are applying customary international law due to respect for it as a source of law, then this approach is likely to be general rather than limited to particular categories of customary international law. Now, one way to test whether a rule of law norm is at work is to look at what was going on in the practice of the political branches. If US courts are applying customary international law simply out of separation of powers rationales, then we might expect the political branches to be quite utilitarian in their approach to whether or not to follow customary international law. If, by contrast, US courts are following customary international law partly out of respect for it as a norm of the rule of law, then we might see a similar respect echoed in the practice of the political branches. And early historical practice does show this kind of respect. To give only one example, the Washington administration debates over whether or not to recognize the revolutionary government of France was influenced heavily by a sense of obligation to follow the law of nations as it was laid forth by Wattel. When Alexander Hamilton asked John Jay whether there was some way they could avoid recognizing the revolutionary government of France and its ambassador, Jay chided him that it was the, quote, duty of the United States strictly to observe that conduct towards all nations, which the law as of nations prescribe. Now, to be sure, obedience with the law of nations often went hand in hand with practical and reputational reasons. But this was also tied to a strong and independent sense of obligation. Too much emphasis on separation of powers justifications omits this normative pull that both the courts and political actors felt towards applying the law of nations. So while I think that Bolia and Clark make a strong case for separation of powers being a consideration that US courts drew from in concluding that they should be applying the customary international law in cases, I don't think they have fully made the case that this applies only to aspects of customary international law as opposed to customary international law writ large. More generally though, I want to raise some questions about what is the debate that we're having here? And is this approach, is this mostly originalist approach, really the way to get there? Now, the way Brad and AJ and Carlos have teed it up, we're having a conversation about how US courts are or are not to apply customary international law. And for me, as I read this article, I see a somewhat different debate going on. And this is the question of the extent to which international human rights law has a place within our constitutional system. Now, the line of scholarship that Carlos mentioned that's associated with Lewis Henkin basically says international law has a place in our constitutional system, and human rights law as a part of international law shares that place. And comparably, the line of scholarship that we associate with Curtis Bradley and Jack Goldsmith, uh, the, uh, Ma, the revisionist provision that was mentioned, position that was mentioned earlier, basically says international law doesn't have that much place in the US constitutional system, and human rights law is a part of international law. Now, what I see the project of Belia and Clark doing is to suggest that we need to spin human rights law off from other areas of international law and treat it differently. And this is something that one can imagine in this context of whether US courts do or do not apply customary international law directly, but it actually has much broader implications because it can relate to things like the Charming Betsy Canon, and you can find you know, similar analogies to be done and drawn in the treaty context. Now, I think there's space for debate 
over whether international human rights law should be treated differently in US law from other forms of international law. But I think it should be for the political branches rather than for the courts to choose to apply these different treatments. And we see this happening, for example, in the Senate's approach to advising and consenting to human rights treaties, which is that it attaches a very particular set of reservations, understandings, and declarations in relation to that. But if there's going to be a debate about whether there's a distinction between international human rights law and other types of international law as a matter of constitutional law, then I'm not sure that an originalist approach gives us much to go on one way or another. And this is basically for two reasons. The first is that this is one of those matters to me that, to borrow from Justice Jackson's, is almost as enigmatic as the dreams that Joseph was called to interpret for Pharaoh. We just don't have a lot of information one way or another about the originalist position on human rights law because, as Carlos points out, it just wasn't an issue back then. But more fundamentally, an originalist approach to foreign relations law, and we're seeing a lot of scholarship and interest in that in the area, is something that is quite hard to reconcile with where the state of the field is today in other matters. So it feels very puzzling to me to make an uh, originalist inquiry into things like how the courts are to deal with the recognition powers and how the courts are to deal with the war powers. When, in fact, if we look at how the recognition powers and the war powers are applied in our constitutional system in practice, it bears very little resemblance to uh, what one might draw out of the original Constitution, either from a textual or from an intent perspective. The original Constitution entrusts Congress with the power to declare war. The US president now has a tremendous amount of power in terms of how we carry out the use of war. The recognition power I actually see to be very opaque within the written constitution, within the original understanding. I don't think they thought about it particularly, and that's one that has been sort of worked out and fought over through historical practice between the president on the one hand and Congress on the other, and perhaps also the president and the Senate for the treaty power as a third norm. So to take uh, an originalist approach here, with regard to the allocation of the separation of foreign affairs powers in this context is something that I find to be incompatible with how constitutional law has developed more generally with regard to the separation of foreign affairs powers. So I will stop there and turn you over to Judge Kavanaugh. Judge. <clears throat> well, thank you all for uh, having me here. I was driving down today. Um, reminiscing as you do on long drives about your first uh, time to a particular place. And I recall driving down to my first time about 20 years ago to uh, this law school. And one of the things that really came into mind was um, don't speed. Uh, <laughs> I do remember that principle being very important 20 years ago when I was driving down. And I was driving down 20 years ago uh, to play in a softball tournament. So it wasn't anything nearly as high-minded as we are discussing here, but it was a Friday afternoon. And I, I learned some lessons on that, not only about speeding, but it, I was playing, I was, I'd already graduated from law school and I had never been here before. And a friend of mine, I was working in DC, a friend of mine was at the University of Chicago, a college friend of mine, he was there at law school and he said, we need some people on the, uh, for the softball tournament at UVA. Can you be a ringer for the University of Chicago softball team? So I, I dutifully said, sure, that sounds like fun. Came down here. Here's another lesson. Never sign up for the University of Chicago softball team. <laughs> we got down here and played William and Mary and it, the first question I, I said when I saw the William and Mary guys was, um, is there a mercy rule? <laughs> we, we, we had some trouble. Uh, so I'm glad to be back here on another Friday afternoon, uh, a couple decades uh, later, to talk about uh, things that we weren't certainly talking about on the softball field uh, two decades ago, something that has become an important issue in uh, the legislature, for the executive branch, uh, for the judiciary. And this law review, by putting on this uh, symposium, all the great articles, I see Professor McConnell here, who's one of the articles tomorrow, and Judge Edwards, who's, who's here and is a colleague of mine and been a great mentor for me. Uh, what, what a great uh, set of panels, and to Professor Clark and Belia for their extraordinary historical work, um, 
They're thinking about this topic over a series of articles, including this article. I congratulate them and thank them for that. To this law review, as the editor-in-chief said, the idea of law reviews is to disrupt stale thinking. And that's important. Uh, Judge Edwards will talk about this, I know, tomorrow and has uh, views on this, but I think the value of law reviews and, and why I find them valuable and why I find this article so valuable to my thinking is that it disrupts stale thinking. It prompts new thinking. It prompts different ways to think about old cases and lines of cases that may not um, make as much sense. And so the professors who uh, do the work on the law reviews, those of you who work on the law reviews, thank you for what, you're, what you do to uh, disrupt stale thinking by the judiciary and by all of, the, of, the, of us who are uh, working on these issues on a daily basis. So on international law, uh, general observations, and then I'll just give you um, some thoughts uh, about how it comes up in courts and, and the issues that uh, Professors Bully and Clark raise and, and how that affects thinking. General observations are the international community right now. Who is the international community? What is the international community? Uh, what, have, what, have, what aspects of the U.S. Uh, of U.S. interests are being respected by the international community. I think that's a broad issue that we need to think about when we think about international law, because international law is not static. It's developing. It's a kind of common law, and it's not always developing in a way that the United States uh, is in the United States' interests. And I think that's something uh, that's a really big picture issue, but when you think about uh, the international community and you think about the U.S. interests and the ongoing war against al-Qaeda, those interests aren't always aligned. When you think about uh, the countries that make up the, the most prominent players in the international community today, Russia and China and the United States, needless to say, their interests aren't always aligned. So to the extent we think about international law, not just as a static body of old principles that everyone basically agrees with, but as a continuing body and a growing body of common law, we have to think about from where that comes, what the source of international law is, where uh, the United States is in relation to the international community and international law. So that's just a big picture thing that concerns me at times when I think about international law, at least customary international law uh, today. Now what about generally as a court? What do I think about international law when I'm resolving cases, which, which the modern view, the revisionist view? I, I start with the notion that in thinking about foreign affairs and war powers generally, that the central body, the first body in the Constitution is the Congress uh, of the United States. And if you look at the text of the Constitution, which Professors Blee and Clark helpfully direct us to do, and think about the history of the Constitution, but you read that text, and we, I think our common perception is, oh, the president is the central player in, in, in foreign affairs and national security. And certainly that's the public appearance. But Congress has enormous powers in the text of the Constitution uh, with respect to national security and foreign affairs. The power to declare war, the power, as Professors Blee and Clark say, with respect to captures. Um, enormous, the recognition power. Enormous powers to uh, essentially direct the United States. What, what's the United States' role going to be in the world? What are the, the laws going to be that regulate how the United States participates in the international community, participates in war? When can the United States go to war? How can it go to war? What tools can it use in the war? What types of surveillance? What types of interrogation? What types of detention? What types of military trial? All those huge issues, Congress, uh, by the text of the Constitution, has to be uh, a central player, right? And so it has been. So it has been throughout our history. There's sometimes a sense, I think, uh, oh, Congress has taken a back seat to the president. Uh, Congress hasn't really acted in the field of national security and, and foreign affairs. And therefore, there's a void that's filled by the president, filled by international law, filled by something else. Uh, but in fact, Congress has been very active in the field of national security and foreign affairs throughout our history. And whether it's uh, today with laws on detention, laws on interrogation, the War Powers Resolution, going back then the Uniform Code of Military Justice, the Articles of War going back to the beginning of our history, Congress 
has carefully regulated throughout our history national security and foreign affairs in, in very detailed and particular ways. And so too it's even regulated when the United States goes to war um, and decided when we uh, as a nation go to war. If you look at every major conflict in this country's history, every one of those with the exception of Korea has been authorized or declared by Congress. Uh, and so Congress has played a central role. Now what does that mean when we think about when, when I as a judge or uh, courts generally think about international law? Well, I start, I guess I start with Justice Jackson's framework, which really is centered on Congress, that, the, that Congress regulates in this area and that the president then acts. And the president either acts in category one with the congressional authorization or in category two where Congress is neither authorized nor prohibited what the president's done or in category three where Congress has prohibited what the president uh, has done but the, but the president is saying that law actually unconstitutionally restricts me. The Jackson framework is highly relevant today. Just look at the Hamdan case of a few years ago in the Supreme Court. Highly relevant in the executive branch on a daily basis and in the courts. And so when I get a case, when courts get a case that uh, call on us to do something in the national security realm, oftentimes it's the executive branch has taken some action and the question is, does the executive branch's action violate a statute, that comes up all the time, or violate a provision of the Constitution? And I take that uh, job very seriously and Justice Jackson told us the courts have a role so let me pause there and say the courts have a role in that in those cases. Some would say, oh, the courts should just stay out of all this altogether. The courts have no role in national security or foreign affairs kind of cases, the political question doctrine. <clears throat> well, that turns out to be historically not accurate either. The courts from the times of John Marshall to Robert Jackson uh, to today. Judge Edwards wrote a very influential opinion uh, a couple of years ago in the Zivotofsky case, which then was adopted by the Supreme Court, which really rejected the idea that there was a politi political question doctrine that kept the courts out of uh, cases. That case involved the recognition power. But the, so the courts have a role. Congress is the central player. We courts have a role. But then when we come in, I'm very cognizant. Courts are very cognizant. The Supreme Court tells us to be very cognizant of the fact that we're not the lead players in national security. So what does that mean when we as courts uh, come into cases? What it means to me is I think it's my role in a justiciable case to enforce what limits Congress has put on the executive unless those limits happen to be unconstitutional, to interpret the statute. Those could have huge national security ramifications, but we as courts think it's our role. But when someone comes in and says to us, we don't have a statute to point you to, judge, that the executive violated, and we're not claiming that the Constitution was violated, but the executive is acting contra international law in violation of international law. I don't see it in those cases. This is something I wrote ad nauseum that would make any law review editor um, uh, happy in about an 80-page concurrence in a case called Al Bahani. I, I wrote a, a long opinion explaining my, my views of this case, but I don't think it's our role in those cases to enforce international law principles against the uh, executive branch. And the reason ultimately, I guess, is, but thinking back to our history and thinking to the structure of our Constitution, I suppose I am uh, an adherent to the, something close to the revisionist view, which is that my view is that there has to be a sovereign source for the law that's being enforced uh, in a particular case. And so if Congress has adopted international law principles into a statute, which it does all the time, or if the executive has ad adopted international law principles into a, uh, a regulation, a binding regulation, which it does on occasion, happy to enforce it. But to go outside the Constitution, the statutes, uh, and to enforce international law more generally, to enforce customary international law, I view as beyond uh, the role, the proper role of the courts. Of course, cases uh, are not always that easy. Sometimes the question is, should we interpret a particular statute, as Professor Galbraith said, in light of international law, the charming Betsy uh, canon? Uh, and, and again, I think that's also a difficult position to put courts into in the national security 
in foreign affairs realm, because in those cases, generally, the executive, by definition, there's an ambiguity in the statute. In those cases, generally, the executive branch is saying, we interpret the ambiguity to allow us to do a certain thing. So who are we court to come in and say, actually, uh, no, executive branch, you can't interpret the ambiguity that way, even though it's reasonable, because it would be in contravention of international law. Who is the best enforcer of international law in a case like that? Is it really the courts, or is it the executive branch in the first instance in a case where there's, there's an ambiguity? So the cases do arise um, that way as well. So my general uh, view on this broad topic is that customary international law, for it to be enforced by the courts, has to be brought into U.S. domestic law by the Congress of the United States, by the President of the United States, acting pursuant to ordinary legislation or adopting it through the treaty power. That it's a mistake, in my view, for courts. I think courts have a central role in uh, enforcing the limits that are put on by Congress and by the Constitution, but it's a mistake for courts to reach out and grab onto uh, principles of international law and use those to bind the executive in foreign affairs and national security arena unless Congress or the executive have done it in the first place. I think what professors Bali and Clark, I, I tend to think they read their position as uh, respecting the revisionist view but pointing out that there's some, like uh, a great article does, pointing out that there's some oddities in Supreme Court case law uh, in some of the immunity cases, head of state cases, and trying to make sense of those cases. And I think they do an excellent job of looking back at those cases from the perspective now and trying to fit them into our current understanding of uh, U.S. constitutional law, of U.S. statutory law, of international law more generally. I thank them for disrupting the stale thinking, for prompting fresh thinking. I look forward to their continued, uh, continued future work. And I thank uh, the University of Virginia Law Review for putting on this panel and this entire uh, couple days of celebration and look forward to the discussion later. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Do you guys want, have anything to respond? Uh, yeah, a couple of quick, quick points. <laughs> yeah, uh, let me, uh, just very quickly and then, um, I mean, we'll have time for some discussion here. Um, I think with respect to Carlos's comments, um, we do have a lot in common. Um, but I do think he put his finger on a point of disagreement, which is that he would like to shift the argument to a higher level of generality than we're comfortable with. So what we tried to do in the article was to look at specific powers uh, and their meaning uh, in light of the understood meaning of those terms used in the Constitution uh, as defined in the Law of Nations in 1789. Um, so, uh, you know, in our view, you really have to start from that, that point. Um, if you do shift to a higher level of generality today when you look at international friction or a dormant foreign relations power, that is a controversial doctrine. It's a doctrine that the Supreme Court kind of endorsed in a case called Zschernig in 1968, but really has not developed uh, or run with in any way. In fact, they've kind of gone out of their way to avoid citing it or relying on it very much at all in the intervening years. Um, so I, I think, you know, you would have to really take the argument to a much higher level of generality than we're comfortable with to do, to, to get to the modern position, um, as Carlos suggests. Um, a couple of thoughts on uh, Professor Galbraith's comments, which were very thoughtful, I thought. Um, I think there's, there's some um, misunderstanding in the comments about uh, our position, because our position was not that at the founding there was a distinction between, uh, uh, um, uh, in the courts, about which provisions of, or which principles of the law of nations to apply. Um, within the branch of the Law of Nations that related to state-state relations, which is what we're talking about, uh, we think that uh, pretty much all of those were, were, could come in through these provisions, more or less. Now, it is true that at the time of the founding, there were three branches of the Law of Nations.
there was the law merchant, and many of you have studied this um, in contracts, um, and those principles are in the uh, restatement and in the Uniform Commercial Code now, a lot of those principles drawn from the law merchant, a uniform body of law to govern commercial rela uh, relations. And then there was a body of the law maritime, which um, related to uh, admiralty and maritime cases. Some of those were private disputes between individuals. Some were more public disputes, like prize cases involving state-state relations. And then there was the real formal uh, law of state-state relations, which is the, the relationship between states, the obligations each state had to each other. And I must say that, um, as to our final comment about you know, whether you can really um, distinguish modern human rights uh, and that you just don't know because it didn't exist. Well, that's not entirely true because in 1789, there was actually a contrary position in the law of state-state relations, which was that every nation had territorial sovereignty within its territory to do what it wanted. And it really wasn't a matter of international concern or a matter of any other nation's concern uh, to interfere. And in fact, if you tried to interfere, you actually were violating the territorial sovereignty of that other nation, which was just cause for war. So it actually was a principle that was um, understood. And I think that um, today that understanding has changed, um, but uh, it doesn't mean that uh, it wasn't addressed at the founding. So we could say more about that, but I I'm going to leave it at that. Um, and just on the judge's comments, which I appreciate very much, um, I guess I would just say that as far as, you know, the revisionist position and international law coming in through a statute or treaty, well, if you, you know, the problem we have a little bit with that is that it overlooks potentially the Constitution as a source of meaning here, right? Because the supremacy clause of the U.S. Constitution says this Constitution, laws made in pursuance thereof and treaties shall be the supreme law of the land. So the originist position focuses on laws and treaties. It kind of overlooks whether any of this law of nations or international law can come in through the Constitution. And that's what we were trying to do in this article. So it's not an open-ended invitation uh, to adopt international law wholesale, but to specifically examine specific provisions of the Constitution to see how international law was either incorporated or uh, related to those provisions. Sure, I'll just add, I'll just add a couple of, of comments. And thank you all for um, your thoughtful and, and, and helpful um, ideas about, about the, the paper and, and the subject. Um, on, on Professor Galbraith's comment that, you know, it's, it's wrong to look at these materials, these original materials or materials surrounding the original meaning, um, as evidencing that courts could only apply part of the law of nations. One thing I think we're trying to argue about, um, or argue against in this body of work, is the idea that then or now, the law of nations has interacted in a monolithic way with the US federal system. Just to build on something that Professor Clark said, at the time of the founding, there were these three branches. Blackstone identified three branches of the law of nations, state-state relations, law merchant, law maritime. One of the ideas we've developed in other work and we're developing in our book is, you know, when it comes to the law merchant, yes, courts applied the law merchant as a general matter in cases within diversity jurisdiction in federal court unless there was some local state law that opted out of it. The states essentially had control over the law merchant, which was different in kind from the law of state-state relations, which Congress and the executive, as we argue, had control over. And so it's just never been the case that the law of nations was a monolith, up or down, yes or no. It was very, con very context-based. And... Um, in terms of the idea that, well, courts should apply the law of nations on, on rule of law grounds. I think at the time the Constitution was adopted, if you looked at the law of nations as it existed then, it all fit well with the Constitution, which isn't surprising because the Constitution was written against that background as it existed. 
There is this law of state-state relations. The Constitution is going to incorporate and accommodate parts of it. There's the law merchant. Federal courts need diversity jurisdiction so they can apply it fairly where states haven't. Well, what happens when those bodies of law evolve over time? You could say, well, there's a rule of law interest in applying them, and so keep on applying them no matter what they are. But the problem is, as they evolve over time, their application can come into conflict with other rules of law. So that happened, for example, with, with respect to the law merchant. Federal courts took the law merchant and ran with it and applied it to everything that traditionally was within the local jurisdiction of the states. And eventually in Erie, the court says there's a structural tension here. We can't do that. And I think that's part of what's going on right now with international human rights law. Is it more akin, should it be treated more like the law of state-state relations, something within federal control? Or more akin to the law merchant, something within state control? It's a very difficult question in part because the rule of law itself has very significant human rights implications. Um, you know, for example, to apply an international principle of human rights against an action that occurs in another country traditionally could have precipitated a war, a human rights catastrophe. Right? Leave it to the political branches, Marshall said. It's undeniably more complicated in our times. Um, final comment, you know, that this debate should not proceed on an originalist approach. That, that may well be true, uh, but I think one of the things that motivated our writings here is that these debates have proceeded in many quarters with a heavy, heavy dose of history. And I think whether you deem original constitutional meaning dispositive, relevant, evidence, something to consider, it ought to be, it ought to be straight. Right, as best as we can discern it.